Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today with New Vision Federal Credit Union. My name is Lester Barron, and I'm here to introduce your speaker today. Um, you know, my lovely wife, Kirsten, has been in the financial industry now for nearly a decade, and she seems to make things that are very complex, simple, and understandable. Uh, she comes from the heart. She came from a social work background, has a degree from Azusa Pacific University, and today she's here to share with you some simple information that could transform your financial life. I'm so grateful that we've gotten to partner up with New Vision to spread the good news about how money works. And today, my lovely wife, Kirsten, will walk you through a few concepts that I feel will give you some amazing tools to, to guide your future. I'd like to also remind you to check out essaychallenge.com. New Vision will be uh, giving out a scholarship. And so anytime I hear the word scholarship, my ears perk up. And I encourage you to go on the website, apply, find out what it takes to get uh, more information and tools. But at this time, I'd like to hear from my better three quarters, my business partner, Kirsten Barron. Kirsten, would you please come on and take it away? All right, thank you so much, Lester. Well, welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm excited to spend some time with you. And so if you are on this webinar, it is probably because you want to learn something about money. Now, the thing about money is that it may not always be the most fun thing to talk about for certain people, but the reality is, is that no matter where you decide to go with your life, what career you go for, what degree you get in school, um, whatever job you end up with, uh, we all use money to survive. And you know the common saying that money doesn't buy happiness. However, it can buy a lot of things that can bring you happiness. And so um, I think one of the really important things is really understanding how money works. Now, one of the challenges is that this is an area that we're really not taught a ton of. Uh, we're not really taught it in schools. Um, you know, I know when I was in high school, I never once took any kind of practical class that taught me how money works, you know, how credit card debt works, how interest works, you know, how much money I should save or any of these things. I, I learned a lot of other things, but I didn't even learn how to manage my own finances. And I don't know about you, but I think that that is something that's pretty important that we should all be learning about pretty early on. And so I'm really happy to be partnered with New Vision and to be able to bring you this information and this webinar just to give you a snapshot and again give you some value that you can apply practically to your life no matter where uh, your career takes you in the future and again these are things that you can apply in your life right now so again my name is Kirsten I've been working in the financial industry getting to teach people how money works now for almost uh, or just over nine years uh, like my husband mentioned when I initially got started in this industry this is not what I got my degree in it's not what I went to school for I actually went to school to be a social worker. And the reason why I wanted to become a social worker is because I love helping people. I wanted to do something where I felt like I was making a difference and I love working with kids. So I thought that that would be the career path I would go. However, the very first job that I got, I realized that it was not something I could see myself the next 30 years of my life. It was very emotionally draining, very stressful. I wasn't getting paid what I thought I was worth. And again, just not something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And so what I love about what I get to do now is that I'm still working with people, still helping people, which is what I love to do, but just in an area that there's such a huge need for. And I'm teaching people things that, again, they can apply in their life and the things that I have applied into my own life that has made the world of difference. So I'm going to be moving through this information kind of quickly. So please make sure to, um, you know, take notes if you'd like to, or if you'd just like to listen along, that's fine as well. Um, but I can, again, assure you that you're going to get some value. And we appreciate your time and commitment to be here. And we're going to start on time and also end on time. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get this going. So hopefully you guys can see all of that. Okay. So again, the topic that we're talking about today in the few minutes that we're together is financial literacy masterclass part two. So I did do a part one. I'm not sure if some of you guys here were on the part one that I did, but this is part two. And so we're going to be covering building your future on a uh, shoestring budget. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about how to create a budget. Uh, we're going to be talking about good debt versus bad debt. We're we're going to be talking about understanding different types of loans and lenders 
establishing an emergency fund and making your money work for you. So these are some of the things we're going to be talking about. So let's start with the first section, which is building your future on a shoestring budget. Now, here is the reality. We live in America, in the United States. And one of the thing about things about living in America is we are a very heavy consumer driven consumerism country okay uh we buy a lot of stuff uh you know living here in southern california i don't know if you guys know but the state of california is the fifth largest economy in the world just the state is the fifth largest economy in the world and so we spend a lot of money on what on stuff on retail clothes eating out just tons of stuff okay so very very heavy um consumer driven society we live in now that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing because we all need things to survive however what we what tends to happen and what i've seen in the experience of me doing this is that what happens is we end up spending far more than we should and we don't prioritize the things that are going to serve us in the long run and so one of the important things to do very early on if you can develop this habit whether you're already working full-time or part-time or maybe you're not working at all is understanding the power of having a budget okay so here is an example on the screen of the habits of a typical american now i know we're in southern california so these numbers are way low <laughs> probably a lot more living in california but just for the purpose of this example you know eating out and take out let's say about 200 dollars a month ride shares almost 100 bucks a month going to events 30 dollars a month um, obviously not so much about that right now as the country is just starting to now open back up from the pandemic. Um, lottery tickets, if you, you know, you do that $75 a month. Coffee and lattes now, you know, it's really easy to, sw to swing by Starbucks and spend $5 and you don't really think it's a big deal. But how many times are you doing that? That money adds up. Um, you know, alcohol, going out for drinks, going out for a dinner, you know, you order a couple of drinks, that just added another $20 on your overall overall bill, new clothes, probably about $100 a month um, or less, you know, 50 to 100, depending on how you spend on that. And then subscription services. We have so many subscription services. Now, honestly, I'm someone I love subscription services. You know, it's really convenient for me. I love getting to just pay a small fee and have unlimited access to something. But when we have so many different subscription services that we're using, that in itself can add up as well. So just a lot of different areas where our money is going. So when it comes to building a budget, having a budget is the foundation to your financial success. Do you have more month at the end of your money? Now, this is what we want to avoid because as we're going through the month, have you ever been in a situation where there was more month left, but you were already out of money? And so we want to avoid that from happening. And so one of the ways to avoid that is by making sure that you're following a budget, okay? Now, for some people, they don't like the word budget because it immediately makes them think of, oh, I'm not going to be able to have fun or do the things that I want to do or get to spend money. And creating a budget is actually the opposite of that. When you keep a budget, it actually allows you the freedom to still do the things that you want to do and get to enjoy the money that you're making, but while still keeping the main thing the main thing and keeping the priorities the priority. So after budgeting, go through each category and shave down as much as you can. So a very simple app that I love to use and I recommend it to all my clients is an app called the Every Dollar app. It's a free app you can download. You can literally just go on your phone, search it, download it. Again, it's called Every Dollar. And it is a free budgeting app that will allow you to create a budget for yourself and allocate all the money that you have coming in on a monthly basis. So if we look on the screen right here, the example that we have, so let's say that your income is $4,200 a month. So let's say that you tithe or give to charity for 20 emergency fund, you put $100 a month into that, and you can literally go in and just plug in all the numbers that you have, okay? Now, the key with using this app and using a budget is that every dollar should be budgeted. So you don't wanna have anything left over that doesn't have a destination. And so that's why when I said that creating a budget actually gives you more freedom, is because you can put in your budget fund money. And that's something 
that we recommend all the time, because again, you still want to be able to enjoy life and do the things that you want to do, but you don't want to overspend and again, get into debt or any of those things. You want to do it responsibly. And so why, by keeping a budget and keeping track of what you're spending, it's again, going to allow you to make sure that you're taking care of all the things that are priorities, making sure that you're still saving money consistently every month, but that you also have some money in within your budget to get your nails done, you know, go to a concert or whatever it is. And so, um, so that is a big thing on budgeting. Okay. Now, if we go on to the next thing, um, the next part is good debt and bad debt. Now debt is, um, is a big part of life. Um, but it doesn't have to be a negative thing. You know, I sit down with a lot of families who have, um, you know, a ton of debt, uh, you know, multiple credit cards, different things like that. And being in debt is not fun, right? And when you're young, you know, you're in a really vulnerable, vulnerable place because maybe you guys have experienced this already, but you probably start getting offers in the mail of pre-approved credit cards, apply for this credit card, you're pre-approved for this credit card. And they start, you know, hitting you really fast. Now, when it comes to debt, I've of, I'm of the opinion that debt in itself is not always just a flat out bad thing. There are good uses of using debt, again, if you're leveraging it properly and you're using it properly. So there are situations where debt is not only a necessity, but potentially smart. Debt can actually provide flexibility and convenience that can help you manage your money and provide for your lifestyle needs. Even when using debt for good purposes, though care must be taken that the debt balance doesn't outpace your ability to make the payments. Good uses of debt may include purchasing a home, right? Vast majority of people need to take out a loan in order to make a purchase on a house. So if we look at the average cost of a house in Southern California, let's just say half a million dollars, um, you know, most people don't have half a million dollars in cash to be able to just go outright buy a house. So what that means is that you have to go to the bank and you have to take out a home loan um, or a mortgage on your house, right? And again, that is just a loan so that you can now buy the house and live in it. And now you're making mortgage payments or making payments on that loan. Now, um, another kind of what we could, would consider good debt is purchasing an appreciating asset or investment. So let's use the example of investing in a business, okay? If you wanna start a business, the average business, or I should say kind of the traditional typical business, takes some kind of investment to get started. So it might require you to either take out a business loan or to go into a little bit of debt, at least just to get it started. But the idea is, is that once your business is up and running, you're gonna create an income that's gonna be far more than whatever you invested into it, right? So that would be the other um, example of what would be considered a wise thing to do or investing in education. So again, the idea that if you're going to be taking out student loans to go to school, um, it's to, you know, better yourself to get a degree and to educate yourself so that you can have the ability to get a high paying job, um, a good career coming out of college that um, you were able to, you know, do once you were in college and you had the right studying that um, that you had to do to be able to get that done. So, um, so again, these would be the examples of that. Now, if we go into what we would call the bad uses of debt, okay? So bad uses of debt can be the biggest obstacle for achieving your desired lifestyle. Debt that spirals upward because strain monthly, or sorry, <laughs> debt that spirals upward because of high interest charges and poor purchase decisions can strain monthly cash flow. Large interest payments perpetuate the debt and can consume the cash flow necessary to maintain your lifestyle and to accomplish your goals. Bad uses of debt include using credit cards to pay for lifestyle needs, okay? And this is where I see a lot of people getting in trouble. They get, you know, you move into a house and you want to furnish your house. So what do you do? You go get buy it on credit cards, right? Buy that fridge, that sofa, that bed, whatever it is on credit cards, using credit cards to pay for clothing and different things like that. This is where it gets challenging because most credit cards, you have to, they don't have a zero balance. They, you have to pay that money back with interest. And all that means in English is that if you spent a thousand dollars to buy something, but you put it on a credit card, not only do you now have to pay that thousand dollars back on the credit card, but you're going to pay it back with interest, 
meaning that you're going to be paying more than the thousand dollars. Okay. And so again, what happens with a lot of people is they get caught in the cycle of getting into too much debt. That's when it becomes stressful and we see a lot of problems happen. Um, also using credit cards to pay other credit cards, right? You don't want to do that. Or using credit cards to purchase depreciating assets, right? Um, using a credit card let's say to buy a, a luxury handbag, okay? Um, you know, let's say it's a Louis Vuitton handbag or suitcase or something, and you put it on a credit card, okay? That is a depreciating asset. It's expensive, but it goes down in value. Once you take the tags off, once you use it a few times, if you try to resell it, you're not gonna get back what you paid for it. The price is gonna go down. So again, that would be an example of a depreciating asset. It doesn't make sense to put something like that on a credit card where now you gotta pay that money back with interest. So now you're paying way more than what you originally paid for that item. So these are things that you wanna make sure that you stay away from, okay? Now, let's talk about loans, understanding different types of loans and lenders. So consumers can get a loan for just about anything they want to purchase, which tells you approximately how many loan types there are available. So there's lots of different kinds of loans out there. Loan types vary because of interest rate or repayment period, but if you want to borrow money to make a purchase, there probably is someone available somewhere who will lend it to you. So, um, you know, a good one is debt consolidation. So sometimes when I sit down with a family put, to put together a plan for them, they have, you know, multiple credit cards open, multiple loans. So they have a bunch of things that they're making payments on. So what debt consolidation is, is where you can apply to act to, for essentially what's happening is let's say the bank is now going to take all the debt, right? And they're going to essentially pay it off in a lump sum loan amount. So now you are just, now you just have one payment that you're making on that loan. So that would be considered debt consolidation. So instead of, again, having a bunch of different things that you're making payments on, um, you apply for a loan through the bank debt consolidation, where essentially the bank is now paying off all the debt into one lump sum. So now you just owe the bank the, that lump sum and you're able to make that payments. Now, there's some good things in doing that because in many instances, you're able to decrease the amount that you have to pay back, but we don't even wanna get there. <laughs> we don't wanna build up debt so that you ever have to be in a position where you have to look at that. Um, and then of course, student loans, mortgages, like I talked about, auto loans, a loan to get a car, um, veterans loans, small business loans, payday, borrowing from friends and family, cash advances, home equity. All of these are different kinds of loans. Now, again, we got to make sure that when we are like going back to the examples that I gave you about good debt versus bad debt, you want to make sure that you're not racking up a bunch of bad debt. Okay. Again, credit cards, lifestyle needs, all that kind of stuff, because it's not going to serve you in the long run. Now I'm going to share with you something, maybe some of you guys have thought this, maybe not, but something that I hear a lot is um, I'll have someone say, well, I use my credit card to pay for lifestyle things like traveling because it gives me points and I'm able to um, use those points for free trips and different things like that. And that's okay. However, I would say be cautious about that because again, you don't want to use it as an excuse to what? To spend, spend, spend with this false idea that, oh, I'm getting points back, so I'm going to be getting free things for it when you're spending way more than you would have even spent before, if that makes sense. So, you know, a lot of us have different strengths. And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm pretty much a saver. You know, I don't like to go out and spend a ton of money on stuff. And so I have the discipline where, you know, I can get a credit card and it won't rack up and different things like that. But if you know that that's not the kind of person that you are, and that may not be your strength. You probably want to stay from that altogether. So again, you're not overspending, you know, for this lifestyle. And now, you know, you don't have any money saved and different things like that. Remember, it's about really keeping the main thing, the main thing and making sure that we're being mindful when it comes to this. Now, types of lenders, while traditionally a bank was probably your best or even your only option if you wanted to take out a loan, the credit industry has now branched out and diversified considerably. So we have banks, we have credit unions like New Vision. Banks are probably your first port of call if you're thinking of borrowing money. Then we have supermarkets and high street stores, many supermarkets and big time retail, big name real retailers, excuse me, 
offer lending facilities alongside their um, other products, right? So that's why if you go into a department store like Macy's, you know, you could get a Macy's credit card or you could get, you know, an Ashley Furniture credit card. Um, online lenders. Online lenders are like banks and other high street lenders with one key difference. They have no physical branches. So everything is done virtually online. Peer-to-peer -peer lenders, peer-to-peer -peer loans work just like any other loan, except that you borrow directly from other individuals instead of going through a middleman. And then short-term lenders, um, short-term loans, also known as payday loans, you guys probably heard a lot about that, are small loans with short repayment terms. Approach with caution. Now, let me tell you something about those payday and short-term lenders. You want to stay away from that stuff because, again, a lot of these loans, when you take the money out, you have to, they have crazy interest rates. So if you have, you know, the average credit card has like a 20 to 30 percent interest rate, some of these short-term lenders, they'll have 50%, 60% crazy high interest rates. So if I borrow $100, what that means in English is that I actually owe them $150, right? Because I have to pay it back with interest. So I would recommend to stay away from that stuff. But again, going to a bank, a credit union is the most common place you're, you're probably going to go to to get a loan for a house, a business, different things like that. So now let's go into the next section, which is establishing an emergency fund. So um, I opened up talking about, you know, creating a budget and things like that. And one of the things that should be in your budget is how much money you're going to save a month. Now, you're probably like, well, Kirsten, how much money should I save a month? So that depends largely on, again, your income, your lifestyle and different things like that. But I would say as a rule of thumb, the first goal is to save no less than 10% of your income. So whatever income you have coming in, develop a habit of automatically putting aside at least 10% of it and then working your way up from there, okay? And so um, now when it comes to saving money, it's really important that your finances are diversified. So right now on this page, we're talking about having an emergency fund. Now your emergency fund is different from the money that you're putting aside for retirement or something like that in the future. And that may sound like retirement is such a far ways away, but the reality is, is that if you want to get to a position where you can actually stop working someday and be able to retire, you have to start now. You got to start as soon as possible. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with someone who didn't start saving for their retirement until they were in their 30s or 40s, even 50s. And when you have to realize that the longer you wait, it just means the more money you're going to have to save later on. So again, develop the habit now of always putting money aside. Now, going back to what we're talking about specifically right now, which is having an emergency fund, it's recommended to have three to six months of your income in your emergency fund. So if I make $50,000 a year, three months of that is $12,500. So that's how much I would want to have in my emergency fund. Um, if I'm easy example, if I'm making $3,000 a month and I want to have three months, I would need to have about $9,000 in my emergency fund as a start. So that is the first goal that you want to work to. And why is that important? Because life happens just because you have your perfectly laid out budget doesn't mean that it's going to be that way every single month stuff happens unexpected um you know expenses come up um you know events happen you know it's life happens life goes on and so that's why it's really important to have that emergency fund so when you do have those unexpected things come up guess what you actually pull the money from your emergency fund. What you don't want to do is go put it on a credit card, which is what the typical person does. If an emergency comes up, they put it on their credit card. But you can avoid that by simply having an emergency fund. So rule number one of your emergency fund is that it is only for unexpected emergencies. That's all. If you have like, you know, we have a trip that my husband and I are going to be taking next month. Um, you know, it kind of came up. And so we just pulled money from our <laughs> from our savings to, to cover the trip. We didn't even have to touch the income that we were making. We just, you know, took care of that. And so, um, so that's the nice thing about having that cushion to know that no matter what happens, you'll be able to take care of it and you can stay out of debt.
Okay. And then rule number two with emergency funds is if you have an emergency, like a broken car, fridge, or whatever, an arm, um, spend the money. That's what it's for. Okay. So again, stay out of that credit card hole. One way to stay out of that and not accumulate a bunch of debt is by maintaining an emergency fund. First goal is to get to six months. The next goal then is to get, sorry, three months. And then the next goal is to get to six months. Um, but I would say at minimum, you want to keep it revolving at around three months of your income. Okay. And then the last section is making your money work for you. Okay. So saving with compound interest versus just saving. Now, if you're like me, when I was a kid, you know, before I had a bank account or an investment or anything like that, and I wanted to save my money, we all had what a, pity, a piggy bank, right? Or maybe you just put your money under your mattress or whatever you did. Um, so again, we're, the good thing is that you're developing the habit of saving money. However, your money is not working for you. So not only do you want to save money, but you want your money to work for you. So See how savings add up compared to how savings earning compound interest add up. So in this example, what you're looking at is let's say we have an account that is opened with $500 and every single month, $500 is added into that account. For 45 years, the money compounds monthly at 6%. Now notice that it's the interest earned that creates significant growth, not the savings added. So if we look over here on this graph, so year one, both accounts started with $500. However, after 45 years, the account where all they did was just continue to add $500 into it a month, right? But the money didn't grow. They ended up with $270,500. But the other person who also was putting away $500 a month, but they were putting it in an account that was earning interest, an average interest of 6%, they end up with $1.3 million, almost $1.4 million, okay? Huge difference. So again, it's not just saving money, it's making sure that your money is working and it's earning interest, okay? That's the benefit of working with someone to help you with that and to guide you on the best place for that. So you only added 270,500 to the account, but in 45 years, it's worth $1.3 seven, almost $1.4 million, okay? So imagine if you could save that money, right? You could save $500, and that's actually a pretty good goal, okay? Especially starting out, you wanna set a goal to save a minimum of $500 a month, you know, depending on what your income and, and if you're able to do that. And again, with it earning interest, you're gonna watch that money grow, but again, it's gonna take time, right? So investing takes time, you know? Uh, don't look for some get rich quick or anything like that. If you build that right habit and let it grow, let it accumulate an interest over time, you're truly going to see the impact that it has. Okay. And then going, continuing on the idea of compounding interest is this formula called the rule of 72. So rule of 72, I think I talked about it on the last one, but this is not something that we're taught in schools, okay? Um, a formula we are taught in school is E equals MC squared. So you guys are probably familiar with that. Anyone ever have to use it in real life? I know that I have not, <laughs> never had to use E equals MC squared. Um, and that was by Einstein. Well, guess what? The rule of 72 was also by Einstein, but the rule of 72, you can actually apply in your life. And so what it says is that the number 72 is significant because if you divide 72 by whatever interest rate you're receiving on your money, it will tell you how long it will take for your money to double. So for example, if my money is earning a 1% rate of return every year, I take the number 72 divided by my interest rate, which I just said was 1%, 72 divided by one is 72. So according to this formula, that means it's gonna take 72 years for my money to double, okay? 72 years at 1%, not very exciting. But if your money is earning 3%, it's gonna double every 24 years. What a huge difference. But if we keep going, if your money is earning 6%, it's gonna double every 12 years, right? So again, we wanna be on that side of the spectrum and you can see what a big difference that that's gonna make over time, okay? And then what starting earlier can do. So it's true. 
saving less earlier can crush saving more later. Look at this scenario with Sarah and George, both saving for retirement. Sarah starts at 22, but stops saving when she's 30. George starts saving at 30 and continues until retirement age. So this is powerful, okay? So I'm going to say that again. This is like, I think, the last slide. So we have two people. One person started at age 22, but stopped at age 30. The other person didn't get started until age 30, which is what most people do and he kept going until retirement age. Both earn a constant 9% annual interest rate on their money, okay? So if we look at Sarah starting at age 22, she sets aside $4,000 a year for eight years in a row and stops after age 29, okay? And her money just sits there and keeps doing its thing. Now, George, same thing, he stops after age 67. Now, look what happens, okay? So Sarah, after stop, she stopped putting in money, okay, after age 30. She only did it for the first eight years, and then she stopped. She ends up with $1.4 million. George ends up with what? $1.3 million, but he's been saving since he was 30 years old, and he had to keep doing it all the way till age 67. Do you see, like, what a huge impact this makes? Okay, so again, it doesn't matter how much you're able to do, you just wanna put aside something because starting early is always gonna be beneficial. And I've never ever sat with anybody in my years of working in this industry, I've never sat with someone who was upset about saving money early. It's never happened. What I do get all the time is people who are in their 40s, 40s 50s, 60s saying, oh my gosh, I wish I started earlier. I get it all the time. Okay. And a lot of times it's really easy when we're young because, you know, we're young, we're just getting started. We're just learning life, figuring things out. And that's probably not on your high priority list. But I can tell you that if you want to get to a place of financial freedom in the future as an adult, and you don't want to be an adult having to struggle with your finances all throughout your life, get started early. No matter what you could do, build that habit early, um, early on. And again, you can see in that illustration, what a big difference that makes. And so, the longer you wait, the more you have to save. Remember that. Yes, it may not be convenient to start now, but guess what? The longer you put it off, the more is going to be required for you later on in age. So if you're 20 years old, and I can't see you guys, but if you're 20 years old and you wanted to have a million dollars by age 67, that means that you would need to start saving $319 a month right now. And that is assuming that the money is growing at about 6% annually, okay? If you wait five years, now you got to save $440. If you wait till age 30, 35, where most people start, now you have to save between $600 and $860. If you wait till you're 40, now you got to save $1,200 a month, okay? So what, where would you rather be, right? Do you want to start small and start early and just build up from that or wait and now have to figure out a way with your income, with now your responsibilities, now you have a family, now you have all these things going on to come up with between one and $2,000 a month to put aside just so you can get to the position to stop working. So again, can't stress this enough. You can see that it's an area that I'm pretty passionate about because I've seen what it's done for myself. I started saving when I was in my early 20s. As, start, as soon as I started work, well, before that, um, I was saving since I was in high school, fortunately, because I came from a household where my mom taught me those concepts. But I understand that that's not the same for a lot of people. So, um, so I think it's really important to be able to share that with you. So um, that is um, as much as it goes as far as my talk. I hope you guys got some value out of that. And um, if you did have some questions, feel free to drop it in the Q&A or in the chat. And now I actually get to pass it over to Matt Nell. He is um, an expert in this area as well, and he will be able to answer any questions that you have. So thank you guys so much for your attention, and I'll pass it over to you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, some fantastic information, a, a lot there to hope everybody was taking notes. There's a lot there to, to digest and some, some great tips. So I'm going to jump into both the Q&A and chat and answer some questions live. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes for those questions, um, but we'll also have a, I'll put my um, email address up in the chat also so that you can send me questions um, individually if you have something you, that we don't get to or you'd like to follow up on. Um, so I've, I've answered a few questions in the chat already, but I'll, but I'll jump back to there. 
Um, Chelsea, this is a question we get um, often is, is, is there, is there an account that accrues nearly 6% in one year? Um, when Kirsten talks about um, savings accounts, those are going to be liquid, right? They're easy money that's easy to get to, which is where you want your emergency fund. You're not going to find one right now in our interest rate environment that's paying a 6% yield, right? Um, you can earn 6% on your longer term funds. Um, and that is a very, a very individual decision. You know, if you're talking about retirement funds, those should be invested for more growth, right? Um, and so if you have funds in your IRAs, Roth IRA, uh, 401k, um, you want to look at investing those for more growth and a, a 6% yield is completely attainable. Um, but it will require you to take some risk in those accounts, um, unlike a savings account. Um, <clears throat> and so I've got a few other questions in the Q&A. Um, I've got a couple of questions from, from students, and that's a challenging situation, right, is where you've got um, school expenses, maybe tuition and room, room and board. Um, as Kirsten talked about budgeting, that's a real important part of What's important in, there, in that situation is controlling your expenses, right? It's knowing where your dollars are going and being in control. Um, it's, it's really easy to have that paycheck come in or, you know, you get, get a, a disbursement from a loan or a grant and, you know, you pay those school expenses and you have a little bit of money left to live on. Um, make sure that you know how that money is being spent. Um, you may not uh, be in a position where you can save a lot, but again, it's the habits that matter. So start saving what you can, write that budget out and say, hey, you know, maybe I can only put $50 a month into a savings account, but get in the habit of putting that money away before you go out, pay your bills, spend money for the month. And um, it's, it's really a, a habit and a discipline that you'll build up over time. Um, I'm gonna see what else we have to answer here. Um, Question about how do you start saving earlier if you have student loans? That's a great question. Um, should you can contribute a certain percent to saving and a certain percent to your loans? Um, when you have student loans, you wanna knock those down quickly, but um, Kirsten talked about a, an emergency fund, right? An emergency fund savings is more important in looking at your priorities of, of where's my money going. Money should go into that emergency fund to get it up to that three month and six month savings before you add money to pay down your student loans, right? You've got a minimum payment. It's X hundred dollars per month that you have to pay on those loans. Don't get behind on those. But instead of paying down those loans quicker, get that emergency fund built up, right? Because that's money that you can access easily. If you take all that money and put it towards your loans, you have an emergency, whether it's the car breaking down or you know something goes wrong, you have a bill that must be paid you can't get that money back from your loans, right? So, so keep it somewhere that's easy to get to. Um, hope that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> Jasmine, how to boost your credit? That's a great question. And that is something that you should definitely sit down with um, one of our relationship specialists at New Vision Credit Union and talk about how do you boost your credit. Um, there's a lot of strategies that go into that. Um, a big one is paying down that credit card debt because the lower percentage you've used of your credit cards, the higher your credit score goes. And then of course, um, making your payments on time. Another part of that question was how, how to save for a down payment in a, on a house. Um, if you've got a short-term goal, let's say three years that you're saving for a house, put that money in a savings account, something that's not risking your principal. Um, you, don't want the, you don't want to put that in a, a mutual fund, for instance, and have the market be down when you go to buy your house and have less money than you put into it. Um, so just be, keep that, those funds easily accessible. And I think I just, just answered that question for you, Chelsea, same answer. Um, keep it somewhere it's easy to get to and where it's not taking any risk if you need it next year for a down payment. Um, we have, I've got time for about two more questions here. Um, What's the difference between a Roth IRA and a 401k? The biggest difference is the Roth IRA is something you can do on your own. It is a retirement account that you can open on your own in just about anywhere, right? At a bank, at a brokerage firm, you can have a Roth IRA just about anywhere. Um, and you can put in 
um, funds, as long as you've got income and earn under a certain cap, you can put funds into that every year. A 401k is an employer plan, so it's provided by someone that, that you work for, right? And they can do a deferral from your paycheck on a monthly basis. Um, so one more question. Um, should you pay off your car first before starting to put away that $500 per month toward retirement? Um, that depends is how I would answer that question. Generally, if you've got a, a low interest rate on your car loan, I would get that money started on your retirement account. Um, make your payments on your auto loan and start saving for retirement. Um, but that is a very, you know, it's, it's kind of is a, a very individual question because if that interest rate is higher, you might want to knock that down first. So again, I would chat with somebody at your local New Vision branch, um, sit down and talk to them about your plan for attacking that debt, getting rid of it, and for saving for retirement. So hope that's helpful, guys. I will put my email address. Again, my name is Matt Nell. I'm a financial advisor uh, for Denali New Vision up in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I'll put my email address in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them over to me and I'll answer. And um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lester to close us out. Thank you, Matt. And what an amazing job done by both Kirsten and Matt today. I hope that you took something from, from the time that we spent together. And remember to check out the scholarship opportunity at sachallenge.com. Um, all information that you need is in the chat or in the Q&A section. Thank you for participating. Do me a favor. Please spread the word because we want to make sure that every single person that we know and we meet and come in contact with gets financial education. Be well. Look forward to seeing you next time on the next SA Challenge um, and, and on the next webinar that we have. Look at the new Vision website for the day. We'll be happy to pass that on to you. Be well. See you soon. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.